Well, I'm really, really grateful to be here today. I appreciate so much the invitation of the elders to come. And I was here last in 2011, and things have changed. Uh, the building has changed. Uh, the size of the group has changed. Uh, but I do remember in 2011, the commonality of today is the spirit of the group, and that's great. And I appreciate so very, very much being able to be with you today. And let me first say that um, I thank you so much for your very uh, generous hearts. Um, talk to the elders about the work in Zimbabwe. And the church here is greatly involved in that. And I want to say thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart, uh, all the good that you are doing. Tonight, Lord willing, I will give a report about that and uh, lots of pictures and allow time for you to ask questions uh, about the work there. But again, thank you so much for your giving. Well, there are lots of folks here that I know. Um, I'm not going to take the time to name all of those folks, but I do appreciate the fact that uh, these good brethren that I've known through the years, I, I will venture out with Jeremy and Kim uh, about 25 years ago back in March. Is that right? Yeah, seems like a lifetime ago. They uh, said, I do. And um, known them a good long while, great people. I'm just really, really thrilled that they are here with you. They're just really great folks. And I uh, appreciate them so very, very much. Now, I'm going to stop there because I start naming folks, and I'll forget your name and call you the wrong name and all this kind of stuff. But uh, you know who you are, and I love you and I appreciate you, and it's good to be with you today. My wife, Mary Lou, is here today, she's sitting here in the middle, and if you haven't got a chance to meet her, uh, we've been married long enough now, she's the better three quarters, and um, so um, please meet her uh, if you have the opportunity. So this morning, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about forgiveness. Um, several months ago, I was in a gospel meeting. And a lady came up to me after services, and she asked me a question. She says, how do you forgive someone? And just, you know, the absolute genius that I am, I said to her, well, you, you just do it. And she looked at me very disgustingly and said, you preachers always say the same thing. And she walked away. And I thought to myself, what a smart aleck. I'll tell you what. She didn't know a good answer when she heard one. Then I got to thinking about that, and I, I thought, you know, um, that was a terrible answer. That, that really didn't help her at all. So I began to think about that, and so I began to study about that. And so today, the lesson's going to be about how to forgive. And I hope that it'll be beneficial to you. I hope it'll be helpful to you. If you're not a member of the Church of Christ, we're really glad that you're here. I'm sure some friend, loved one has invited you to come. Hope you brought your Bibles. We'll be looking at the Bible and uh, reading from it. Uh, but we're glad that you're here. And if you have any questions at all about anything that I might say, um, I'm happy to talk to you about those things. If you're having any question about the church here, it's work, it's worship, what they're doing, what they're not doing. Uh, these brethren would be glad to talk to you about those things. It's good to see the members that are here. We appreciate you. I'm sure there's some visitors. I know there's some visitors. Glad that you're here as well. So what we're going to do, I'm using kind of a springboard effect from John 7 to verse 46 and I'm just quoting from the ESV here. No one ever spoke like this man. Context is, Jesus had been teaching and performing miracles. 
And the more he taught and the more miracles he performed, the more angry the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, the scribes, the more angry they got. And they just couldn't stand all the good that Jesus was doing. So they sent some officers to arrest him. The officers went to arrest him, and they began listening to the things that Jesus had to say. They come back empty-handed, and they just simply say to the Jews, No one ever spoke like this man. Well, when you read the Bible, you find any number of just profound statements that Jesus made. We just read in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, to me, one of the most profound statements that Jesus ever made. He says, For if you forgive men for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But then he goes on to say, But if you do not forgive men, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. That passage, that statement by our Lord, maybe at first reading, just seems to be, uh, well, yeah, I'm supposed to forgive others, and He'll forgive me, and uh, let's, let's go to another verse. Well, in my own life, I have found through the years that I thought I forgave someone, but I didn't. So how would you know? How how do you go through the mental gymnastics of getting from point A to point B that when someone does something wrong to you, that you actually forgive them? What has to happen? So for the next two and a half hours, we're going to talk about that. So uh, buckle your seatbelt, put your seat in the upright position. We're going to take off and talk about that. So... Satan is all about accusing. That's what his name means, accuser. But it is God who forgives. When you fail to forgive, who are you more like? I think most of us as disciples of Christ, we like to think of ourselves as being Christ-like. And it's essential that we're Christ-like. But we must be careful that we're not accusers. Forgiveness is an absolutely beautiful thing. We need God's forgiveness. I can't afford... Not to be forgiven. So I must be a forgiver. I must do that. So as we talk about forgiveness, I'm going to suggest that it's very hard. It's very difficult. There's probably many of you that have such generous hearts. You have such, you know, good hearts, sincere hearts that you maybe don't have any problem with forgiving others. Then there's the rest of us. Who, someone has said something, someone has done something, someone didn't say something. Preachers are especially vulnerable. You know, we can work real hard, work up a really great lesson, and just preach our hearts out, and when brethren come out, Nothing is said. Preachers have such egos. We need to be built up that we're just awesome. So, we can easily get our feelings hurt when someone doesn't compliment or someone doesn't notice. But forgiving even something that might be considered trite or insignificant. But from our viewpoint, 
We accuse. We hold it against them. We're bitter. We're angry about that. When we think about God's forgiveness, the lesson is not really focusing on God's forgiveness, but we cannot talk about forgiveness and not talk about God forgiving. We must do that. But in 1 John 4 and verse 8, one of the tremendous statements that is made about God is that God is love. Notice, God doesn't love. (laughs) He does. But God is love. The transformation of the gospel of Jesus Christ coming into our hearts is for transformation purposes. It's not that we just are satisfied that we love and that we have joy, but we become love and joy and peace. That transformation process is the work of the gospel in our hearts. Well, God is the ultimate of that. So what we're trying to do, we're trying to be like God. We're trying to be like Christ. And we're trying to love. Well, when we think about love, what we learn from Daniel and what we also learn from Jeremiah is these two tremendous points is that God is compassionate. God forgives. You may remember the the, the con- the context of Daniel 9, the the, the prayer that he uttered when he realized in reading Jeremiah the 70 years and, and the time is up and God's people are not what they ought to be and he prays intently to God about the forgiveness and he thanks God for his compassion. And the thing about God's forgiveness is that he remembers it no more. Just a quick, I'm a a teacher, so I tell you what I'm going to tell you, and then I tell you, and then I tell you what I told you. But one of the things about forgiveness that you might key in on and think about, if you claim to have forgiven someone and you're still talking about it, er, didn't forgive. God doesn't bring it up. What he's forgiven. But we continue to accuse. We didn't forgive. Okay. So let's move on. Let's talk a little bit about. What Paul said. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. When I stop to consider the things that I've done, my attitudes, my actions, my lack of doing good, my aggressiveness of doing bad, I think about all of those things. And I think about the power of the blood of Jesus Christ in my life. I need to be able to have that kind of kindness toward others. So how do you forgive? Well, it's going to be pretty simple. Number one, you got to love the offender. And I've included 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5, and I know that you are well familiar with that great text. But if you'll notice specifically one of the characteristics of love, yea, God is love, the text says, does not take into account a wrong suffered. An accounting term. So it just might be that we are the kind of people that we keep track of what people have done against us. And we don't forget that. Now, we may say, oh, I've forgiven them of that a long time ago. But we still got it on our list. And we review it from time to time. And then when we review it, it gets us all riled up and disturbed again. And we become angry about that. Did we really forgive? Well, here's love. You do not take into account a wrong suffered. How you treat someone, what you do for them. Uh, how you act to, uh, react to them and act toward them, you, you don't take that into account. 
I don't care who you are. That's hard. That's hard. Secondly, you release the offender from your punishment. If you do me wrong, well, what am I going to do? Do you more wrong? I've told this story several times. Mark Raymer is here in the audience this morning. And uh, he and I grew up in the Ville back in the late 1800s. And we um, hung out in each other's neighborhoods. And the, 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 the rule of the jungle was, you know, there was a bunch of guys. We'd fight, play ball, fight, play ball, fight, play ball, and then fight some more and stuff. And the, the, the rule was that if a guy hits you, it, it don't matter if he's just funny, you know, hey, how you doing? Or if it's a fight hit. On a scale of 1 to 10, if his hit is 3, the rule of the jungle is you've got you know, you to go a 12. You've got to go a 13 in return. You've got to knock him out. Sends a message, you see. Sends a message. When you grow up with that kind of disposition and attitude, that doesn't just go away. Paul mentions this, not Mark and I's neighborhood, but in Romans chapter 12, he says in verse 17, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. That's pretty clear. (laughs) That is pretty clear. Never Pay back evil for evil to anyone. Resist or respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him, and if he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. My wife and I have been in North Alabama for a number of years uh, too long to travel to Indianapolis. Um, People drive different in the north than they do in the south. We do a lot of bless your heart down there. Um, Y'all don't quite say that up here. But just driving from Indianapolis over here to, to, to Brownsburg and then back over here, uh, um, the traffic patterns, the, the people's attitudes, you know, when you need to get in and they don't want you to get in. And, and it, it just, uh, it's very difficult to not be retaliatory. If someone does something to you in the driving circumstance, We tend to want to repay, whether it be communication with hands, things we say, actions, attitudes. I'm sure none of you all know what I'm talking about. But you know, as disciples of Christ, we are trying. We are trying to develop the spirit likened to Christ as to how we react to others. So when someone sins against us, what do we want to do? Punish them. Say something. Do something. We want them to feel our pain. Now please, don't insult me by sitting there and thinking you've never done that. Do good to the offender. Verse 21 of our Romans 12 passage, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Here's the key. Somebody said something bad to you, say something nice in return. Somebody did something bad to you, do something good to them in return. That is so, so, so against the world. So I'm trying to to tell us all that our not forgiving 
It's pretty normal. But if we're going to be like Christ. And if we expect God to forgive our sins. Don't celebrate the offender's failures. Our world is all about competition. And there's no greater enemy than we have than a competitor. And they actually do us wrong. They sin against us when they beat us. So we try to do all that we can against them. And when they lose, we celebrate. Yeah, look what that, yeah, man. You're a loser. Have we ever thought about treating the offender with the golden rule? Do unto others as they do unto you. Is that the way it reads? It's, it's difficult. And I, and I keep talking about hard and difficult because I believe it is. At least, at least with me. When someone has offended me, hurt me, To treat them good. Stop dwelling on the past offense. I'm kind of good at that. Thinking back over the years. What someone did. And when you're driving down the road long distances. And I I do that quite a bit. Preaching meetings and so forth. So I've got some time and I'm thinking and. I'm thinking about this church and these brethren and this situation and so forth. And you get to thinking about that and it just gets you all riled up, you know, again, that that happened and what was said and what wasn't said and what was done. We've got to stop doing that. You've got to stop feeling sorry for yourself. Yeah. We were treated badly. Yes, we were sinned against. Why did this happen to me? Well, bad things happen to good people. I think the devil, when he gets us to the point that we feel sorry for ourselves, and we rationalize that, Nothing like this has ever happened to anyone else. He has you in a place where he can defeat you. Forgive 490 times. You remember the passage? If your brother sins against you seven times and returns seven times and says, I'm sorry, I repent, what are you supposed to do? Forgive them. Well, Jesus was even questioned later in another context by saying, I don't say seven times, but 70 times seven. Now, let's test that theory practically just a bit. Kevin knew him back when he was like junior high school. Played basketball, his dad, and several other guys. Kevin's grown up to be a man. So if I go back there and say, hey, Kevin, what's happening? Right in the nose. I'm sure he's going to appreciate that. And as he's wiping his blood off his nose, he's saying, man, what is, what is wrong with you? Why did you do that? I'm sorry, Kevin. I don't know what came over me. I was remembering that game we played back in the back in the day, and you scored on me. Then I walk away and I turn back around and one more time. I do that seven times. What do you think Kevin's gonna do? Eight times, nine times, ten times. 
You think Kevin's going to retaliate? You think he's just going to keep wiping his nose? And everything's fine? And I say, I'm sorry every time? You follow what we're saying here? First, think about ourselves. How many times have we asked God to forgive us and turn right around and do it again? Turn right around and do it again. Turn right around and do it again. Do you think God forgave you every time? So what am I supposed to be able to do? Forgive every time. But for many of us, that seems impossible. How can I do that? Forgiveness is the power that breaks the chains of bitterness and anger and sets you free from the shackles of your own prison. I think that particular statement helps me to understand what I have done to myself a number of times is that I didn't forgive. It was so heinous. It was so difficult. It was so hard. It hit me so right between the eyes. I, 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 Lord, you know that I just can't handle this. I just can't get over this. It's really, really hurt me bad. Well, all I've done is to imprison myself with bitterness and anger because I haven't forgiven. Some of you, maybe some of you, may know that a number of years ago, a very unfortunate thing happened with my parents. My father, he shot and killed my mother and he killed himself. Happened in 2000. When I found out that news, it just destroyed me. My parents were Christians. And I think at the time, Andy, where are you at? He was an elder there at Manslick Road at the time, right? Where my parents went to church. Jeremy's father. Now I got that news, it was just, it was just like, th- that can't be true. That couldn't have happened. The reality was, it did happen. Why did it happen? Could never find the answers to that. Blame, accusation, accusing. So a number of years, I thought that that was behind me. But I still thought about that. I'm still angry. I'm still bitter. Forgiveness is not easy, but it is essential. We must learn to forgive because we need God's forgiveness so desperately. I don't know why that happened. But I trust and believe in a God who will make the right call on the day of judgment. Whatever that call is, he'll make the right call. I know that if I don't forgive, and if I don't move on, I'm not going to be forgiven. Forgiveness. A friend of mine, Keith Stonehart, he wrote this. No one leaves a family without breaking someone's heart. 
No one leaves the church without breaking someone else's heart. The church is a family, not a business. Jesus wants us to be family, not customers. When there's a problem, work it out. To me, this is one of the practical aspects of forgiveness. Is that if you are a Christian for any length of time, you're going to have a disagreement. You're going to have a problem. You're going to have an issue. Somebody is going to say something. Someone is going to do something. And then as brothers in Christ, what do we do about that? Do your best to work it out. Do your best to encourage those you're in contact with and or yourself to repent, to change. But then there must come forgiveness. Forgiveness. Oh, I have forgiven them, but I will never forget what they did to me. They hurt me so badly, I want nothing to do with them ever. And the sad thing about it is you have Christians who have wronged each other, who will not repent, who will not forgive, and they both expect to spend eternity around the throne of God together. It's not going to happen. It's not God's intent. I don't want to be anywhere near them. In Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 43, you may recall in this same Sermon on the Mount, Jesus more specifically talked about this. And he says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. For He causes His Son to rise on the evil and the good. He sends the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. What is he perfect in? Love. He is love. The bottom line, brother and sister in Christ, is that whatever the circumstance, whatever the situation, do not, do not be deceived into thinking that you are unique and that this has only happened to you. No one else has ever suffered this way. That's a lie. You must learn to forgive. Forgiveness doesn't excuse behavior. I've long since given up trying to figure out why. My dad didn't ask for forgiveness. But I forgave him anyway. It doesn't change what he did. God will deal with that. When someone sins against you, you can forgive them. That doesn't take away their sin. Only God can take away sin. They have to make that right with God. I will encourage them to repent. I will encourage them to do the right thing. But I must release them. I must give it to God. I have to give it to God. Forgiveness prevents their behavior from destroying your heart. When this event occurred, the elders where I was preaching at the time, they told me to take off however long I needed, recover and so forth. 
And I just really, for a good long while, just sat in a dark room by myself. I, I didn't know what to think. I'm not a crier, never have been a crier. I cried constantly, uncontrollably. My emotions were totally wrecked. I didn't know if I'd ever preach again. And my daughter, who was still at home at the time, her and her, she and uh, her mother stood at the door where I was sitting in the dark room. And I heard my daughter say to her mother, when is dad coming back? And I don't know why that affected me, but it did. I want to ask you a very, very serious question. When are you coming back? When are you going to allow how you've been wrong so badly? Give it to God. Forgive. Release yourself. Almost from that time on, I've been trying to learn how to forgive. It's important. It's vital. You, you may be in a prison today. The prison of your own bitterness and anger. Forgive. And whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone, so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your transgression. We're quick to ask God to forgive us. But how quick are we to forgive others? Someone said, Mark Twain, allegedly quoting an asylum inmate that he interviewed, forgiveness is the fragrance that the violet sheds on the heel that is crushed it. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is a beautiful thing. Whether you're in Africa or you're here at Trader's Point. Obeying the gospel is just absolutely the most wonderful, greatest, most goodest thing you could ever do. When the blood of Jesus Christ washes away your sin. But you have been created in Christ Jesus for good works. Therefore, forgive others as he has forgiven you. Well, that's what I come to tell you. I hope you'll study that, think about it, pray about it. If you have questions about that, uh, anything that you disagree with me about what I said, uh, ask Jeremy about it. And um, he'll discuss it with you. I'd be glad to talk to you. But I thank you for listening this morning. If you're not a Christian, now would be a great time to become one. I'm sure there's water in the baptistry. There's clothes. Jeremy, some of these good brethren here can baptize you into Christ even this day. And every sin washed away. But if you're a child of God. And you've got anything. Anything against anybody. Forgive. Encourage them to repent. They must answer to God. But forgive. Won't you come as we stand and sing?